presenter view is working. It's all good. Hello, uh, I'm Chris. Um, I'm here um, at this conference with a couple of colleagues, so we're, we're all presenting in different sessions and unfortunately missing each other, but Kieran uh, has worked on this project with us, so i um, glad he's been able to make it. So, um, I'm hoping because there are only two of us, we might get an extra few minutes, but it depends on the chair, really. Okay. Okay. Cool. So, um, Scapa 100. Scapa 100, unlike the projects you may have seen this morning, is actually a work in progress. Uh, Scapa 100 is about the uh, community activities that are uh, about to happen and are being planned for the centenary events of the scuttling of the German high seas fleet. So that's World War One, end of World War One, the armistice. Um, uh, talks are going ahead and the German high seas fleet, fresh from Jutland and other battles, is in, uh, interned in Orkney uh, in, um, really for about six months. So it's the last events of World War I and the last military event was the actual scuttling where in June 1919 uh, the Admiral in charge, uh, von Reuter, uh, scuttled the vessels to stop the Allied forces distributing them amongst themselves to reuse. So they said, they're not having them, we'll destroy them. So a bit of a, there's a lot of conspiracy theories about whether he did it under his own um, uh, volition or whether there was an order secretly in. But basically, um, they're all packed into the natural harbour at Orkney, um, at Scapa Flow. Scapa Flow is a body of water. It's a big natural body of water in Orkney Islands, which is uh, just north of the mainland of Scotland. Uh, it happened on the 21st of June, 1919. As I said, the final military act of World War I. So you can see after the scuttling, that's the remains of the Durflinger just sitting upright. Uh, and it was rare uh, that the ships actually sat upright. When they, were, they had all the water flowing into them from the, the vents that were opened, they usually flipped over. They'd get heavy on one side and the, they were top heavy, so they would flip. Um, the salvage of the wrecks uh, continued right into the 1970s. And then since then, there's been illegal removal of artifacts, which we're kind of getting involved in the recovery of. So a bit of background. There were 74 ships initially interned. Uh, von Reuter ordered the scuttling. And there are, most of them were salvaged in the 70s. And I think there were about 24 left after the final salvage operation. And, there, and, and today, there are seven uh, of them still on the seabed. And they're, they're pretty much d designated as protected wrecks because they're historic monuments, basically, uh, and they've been protected since 1984. So between the 70s and the early 80s, they were pretty much ransacked by uh, recreational divers. But thankfully, they're still in diveable condition. They're still recognizable as shipwrecks, although most of them are pretty much uh, uh, damaged by salvage. So one of the projects we have, we're aiming to complete by the centenary in 2019, is a project called Battleship Explorer. And that's based on creating immersive VR experience on this particular wreck, the SMS Markgraf, which is the biggest remaining battleship in the flow. It's at a depth of about 44 to 45 meters at the seabed. So it's just about within the range of uh, recreational diving without technical equipment. So it's very, very popular wreck. Um, so the plan is to use a combination of multi-beam sonar data. Does anybody know what multi... If, put your hands up if you know what multi-beam sonar data is. Right, I will tell you what multi-beam sonar is. You know when um, you get... Um, a, a, a pregnant lady will go in uh, for a scan and they have the little handheld scanner and what that does is it basically emits sound around uh, the fetus and then ref the reflection of that sound gives some sense of depth. So uh, it's the same idea, except on a much bigger scale. Instead of a single sound uh, sonar signal going out, there, we have hundreds, if not thousands of them. And they are emitted from a boat uh, or a, a device underneath the boat. And it's, it's towed across the top of the wreck, backwards and forwards, like mowing the grass on your lawn. So backwards and forwards. And then you put all this data together. If this echo takes longer to get back, you know there's an object that's deeper. And when it's quick coming back, you know the, the distance is quite short. So we get very, very, very accurate uh, images of using multi-beam sonar of these very large objects. It's great for big objects because uh, it gives a very good overview. Um, 
So what we plan to do is use the multi-beam sonar as a kind of overview map. Now, if you've, anybody's used any VR toys, quite often you'll be able to look at an environment and turn the controller over and suddenly you have a map of your environment that you can select where you want to go and you'll transport to that. Or you can just point at the area and transport. Uh, with these objects, they're so big. Uh, if you're just standing up at the bow section on the left of the image here, I'll move to the bigger image. The bow over here sits about 12 meters high. So if you imagine if you dive on that wreck and you sit at the front and look up, you're looking into the gloom and beauty of this kind of massive thick. So a 12 meter jump is quite a big distance. So what we're doing is using a mini model of this based on the multi-beam. And then you would just click on which bit you wanted to go and visit. Um, there will be some areas that will be not worth visiting, so we'll, we'll highlight the areas of interest. You'll be able to work your way along, generally at seabed level from the bow, along this side, uh, which is the starboard side, you can see in one point, I think this is switched on, but one area, here is the, the, the mast off the ship and the spotting top still attached. Uh, you can see here that the, this is where salvage was done to remove uh, torpedo tubes and various heavy metals. And then at this, at the, towards the stern here, you can see the upturned rudders. Propellers have gone, this massive hole here is very, very interesting. There's lots of cool stuff in there, but that's where the boilers were. So all the heavy metals for the boilers and the engines were removed. So that's why it's smashed up. Um, so it's about 120 meters long. Um, unfortunately, when you zoom into this kind of data, and if I do have time at the very end, I'll show you an interactive version of this and show you how the detail disappears the closer you get, because it's just a point cloud. It's just dots in 3D space. Um, so the detail, the interesting stuff is small scale relative to the ship. Things like gun barrels sticking out of the side. Uh, there's remains of the, of the boilers you can see on the inside up in these areas. And then there's portholes along the side here, which is still have glass in them, which is amazing after this amount of time, 100 years almost. Uh, so the plan is to then, rather than just use multi-beam sonar to create the experience, we're going to do a combination of multi-beam and photogrammetry. So this is some experience that we've been carrying out on other wrecks uh, in scaffold flow. So this is another one that was scuttled. Uh, this is the Brunner, which is a mine layer. And if you just look at the red highlighted area, we have a photograph of that. That's near that there's a mast here and then there's a what we call a, a observation platform and it has a beautiful brass rail around it. And here's a photograph of that area. So this little there's a brass rail running along. It actually goes under the seabed and then little bits of it start coming back up. Uh, and of course, this is a well-lit photograph by a professional photographer called Mario Tinkinen, uh, probably um, one of the best photographers I've ever met, particularly with underwater stuff. And then what we've done is myself and our colleague, uh, Kari uh, Heitonen, I work with a lot of people from Finland, um, we produce this data. So this is from a series of about 600 photographs and we've produced a 3D model in photogrammetry. Now compare that to what you can see here. It's maybe about 120 dots in that area and then we've got something like four and a half million points here with colour and texture. The other thing I didn't mention, multi-beam sonar does not give you colour. All of this shading is something that we add through our visualisation process. So you get the idea, you would be able to transport yourself to here and then walk around this thing and see all the uh, interesting stuff there. So, recap, multi-beam data good for big stuff, photogrammetry good for close detail, so we're combining the two. So we've been working on this idea for, for a couple of years, um, developing it towards the SCAP 100 events of next year. So the first project we, we, we got to really play with was the HMS Hampshire project, which sank uh, a little bit earlier. It was transporting Lord Kitchener, who was the guy who was on, in all the recruitment posters uh, in Britain for trying to get young men to send themselves off to death. Um, of course, he was a very wealthy man. He didn't go himself. He just floated around uh, on battleships out of reach, except for this one event where he was heading to Archangel on, on 31st of May 1916 uh, to, to negotiate a kind of arrangement with the Russians. Uh, and just north of Orkney, they hit um, two mines that had been laid by a U-boat about a day and a half earlier. So very, very close uh, proximity from them being laid to 
the ship being hit. Uh, it sank with 737 lost, 12 survivors, so pretty disastrous. But I've highlighted this um, little area here because it's a feature that we've, we've, we're really focusing on for what we're doing. Uh, it's a bit, fairly unique shaped ship. The, the World War I ships had this kind of scooping bow and they also had a pointed um, stern. If you look at it from the top, it actually came to a point rather than a flat end like most ships are these days. So quite interesting design. But here you can see, I don't know if you can quite make it out, but there's basically two gun turrets uh, uh, attached to the side of the hull, one at the lower section and one at the top. So we, we'll focus on that in a minute. So the Hampshire, HMS Hampshire, the was slightly cropped on this end, but never mind. And that's the same area. So there's the turret. And this is where it sits on the wreck. So the wreck's upside down in about 65 metres, so quite a bit deeper than the, the mark graph. And the mast, I've flipped that upside down to try and give a better idea. It doesn't help you much, but you can see the mast sticking out there is this mast here. So where we've got lots of destruction, uh, pretty much from the wreck being under there for 100 years and having gone from the surface to 65 metres very quickly, smashed itself into the seabed. It's in, it's in bits, but it's, the visibility we had for our project was fantastic and we were able to gather data from pretty much all of the side of the ship. So again, the multi-beam gives you the big picture. And then when we get in closer, you're going to see detail. This is another one of Mario's photographs, and this is the photogrammetry team. So that's me on the right, you can barely see me. Then there, we have Carrie with the cameras and two lights here, and then Imi Wallen, um, yet another uh, fin. Uh, project producing the extra fill light there. And there's the turret on the seabed. Uh, so you can see there's no gun coming out of this bit because apparently that was welded over. It, it was the bit that was lowest to the water and used to gather water in when it was at sea. So it's bad design. So they welded a panel over that which has rotted away. And then you can see the barrel of the, the upper gun just coming out on the seabed here. So this is us carrying out the process of, of gathering the data. There's no ambient light at 65 metres in the North Sea, so we took our own. So this, this bank of lighting here, excluding the lights that the photographer's assistant has here, this bank of lighting is about 130,000 lumens. But we're limited by two things. One is the depth, so we can only stay down. We planned on less than two hours deco, so we were down on the wreck about two and a half hours. Uh, that meant 20 minutes actually on the wreck, and then and two, two hours, 10 minutes coming back up. The other limitation was the batteries for these lights, because they have to be handheld, are only about this size. So we have them strapped on, but they only last 25 minutes. So that's our limitation, depth and lighting. We're working on the lighting issue. There's not much we can do about the depth. We're kind of stuck with those deco uh, problems. But having said that, for the two weeks that we had access to the wreck, the first three days we had perfect conditions where you could see about 40 metres from with your torches. You could see 40 metres away from you. I've dived in the Scapa Flow for about 15 years, and it's the first time I've ever been able, been able to see anything more than five metres away from me. So we had amazing conditions to get this data. And what I, I like about this image, other than it reminds me of all the process we went through and the diving, which was cool, is it's very, very accurate representation of the object. And if you compare that back to the little dots on screen we get with the multi-beam, I'm just reinforcing the point. We get much better resolution and uh, texture from the photogrammetry. Um, we shoot, if anybody does photogrammetry, quite often on land you will shoot with a, a good DSLR and you'll take shots and you'll have even lighting and you'll shoot raw so you can colour it correct. We only had 20 minutes to cover pretty much 100 metres plus of wreckage, so we shoot video, because we know if we keep moving slowly with good lighting, we'll get the depth of field to get a reasonable sequence of images, and we take about two frames per second from that video to make the, to have a go with the photogrammetry. We're, um, with this project, we were, we were only using HD video. We've now got 4K cameras, so we'll be shooting the next stuff, particularly with the mark graph at 4K. Uh, so this gives you another idea of the layout and also the visibility. So that's Carrie with the, the camera here and two pilot lights. There's Amy with the big light and me with the fill light at the top. 
and then again this is just a safety diver coming along behind us in case we've got any trouble because we're focused if anything's bubbling behind us then we need somebody else to spot that and you can see the bank of light we're getting from those torches is just it's like daylight it was fantastic good quality stuff um, we covered pretty much the port side so you can see the bow here so that's where the impact remember this is upside down so that's the cut of that bow that we saw in the photograph um, and then this is the section that would have hit the mines. We, what we think is it hit a what's called a chain mine. So it's two mines attached by a chain. So as the bow goes through, the mines get swept back and hit the ship on either side. So you've got double impact. And the evidence is that that's, that's what happened. And then we've got here, even with a good, a fantastic photographer and lighting from divers and a little bit of ambient light, that's about as far as you can see from the bow to about here, which is probably about eight to nine meters back. With the photogrammetry, there's the turret that I pointed out, and we can see all the way back to the stern, and then the, the one remaining propeller that's, that's on there. And that is about seven meters across, that propeller. So it's a big thing. And this uh, data is covered in two dives. We have a little bit more data that goes the other way from dive three, and we connect to the bow. But I wanted to put this in because it shows you you can actually align, rather than just the smaller turret area, which is about 10, 15 meters square, you can actually cover, if you light it consistently, you can cover quite a bit of distance. But there is a limitation um, on measurement. So I'll rush through the last bits. I've been given the five minute warning. Um, so we're, we're using uh, VR setup using HTC Vive and Unreal Engine at the moment. And we've, this, was when we were still wired, we're now wireless, which helps. Uh, and here's just an example of that turret section. So this is an unreal in the, in the VR situation. So we've tried to mimic the diver's experience. So there's a light attached to the user's head. So if, wherever you look, you'll illuminate. And then the, one of the controllers has a torch attached to it. So you'll see as we move in towards the turret, you get the pool of light that the torch is illuminating. And the other thing we found, uh, and because the stuff has been shot, this way, pointing a light pretty much directly at it and recording the data. It illuminates really accurately compared to the original experience. The other stuff that Kieran put into this, which you can't really see on this projection, but there's lots of little dots of um, sea snot uh, floating around you. So you get a bit of depth perception and these illuminate as well. I think you see a little bit of it at the end. Um, but the main point is that we're trying to emulate what the divers saw. And this is full scale. So this is designed as you walk around you're looking up at the, uh, the the real size of it and the other thing that we found almost by accident uh, was that having the HTC Vive on your face is a very very similar feeling to having a dive mask on we're trying to present uh, pretend that we designed that in but it's just a, a freebie but it is amazing how many people saw that so the next project uh, was HMS Vanguard I'll rush through this because we're out of time uh, same idea, we, we, this was a massive explosion uh, in Scapa Flow, slightly shallower, only two survivors. All the projects we work, work on are like all about death, it's pretty terrible, but a lot of archaeology projects are. Uh, you're usually dealing with stuff that the people who used it are no longer around, so it's not dissimilar. It's just a little bit more recent memory. Um, you can see these two images here. This is one of the turrets when it was being installed. So the gun barrels are not on, but you can see the cradles for the barrels. And this image here is one of the turrets on the seabed, and you can see the cradles again. So I wanted to focus on that uh, before we see this little bit of video. This is the 3D photogrammetry model of the stern section. So it's blown away from the main wreck. This is the whole stern section. There's a curve here that used to be extended off the deck and that's the turret that sat in that hole. So that's Y turret, it's the last turret uh, towards the back, and this is X turret. And we managed to cover that in three dives. Uh, very, very cold, very bad visibility in January. Um, so we were very, very close to the wreck. So you get this striping where the light's not quite been even. So it's one of the problems we have to deal with. Here's the rudder, the other rudder is under the seabed, and the, the propellers would have been attached around about here. There's a salvage hole there where the rear torpedo tube was. So what the salvage guys did was they blew a hole in there to see if it's worth uh, taking out, and it wasn't, so they left it. If they'd taken the, the, um, the torpedo tube out, sorry, 
Um, if they'd taken the torpedo tube out, then the rest of that stern section would have collapsed into nothing. We'd have seen nothing except debris. Uh, but it's quite nice because it's, it's one of the most prominent parts of the ship still left on the wreck. And the other most prominent part is at the bow section. So the two ends survived because it blew up in the middle and those two bits moved out away from the centre. Um, and the last bit of video from this is the turret. So this is... Um, this is X turret, you just saw in a fairly low resolution point cloud. This is higher resolution point cloud with about 12 million points. Photogrammetry model, there's no meshing or anything on this. This is pretty much as, it, as, it, as good as we could get it without meshing. And you can see the detail again. You've got the, the cradles here for the, where the barrels of the gun, the, the barrels were just shot out like this in that direction. And this uh, trolley, this is a, basically a lift for the munitions to come up from the bottom of the ship to be loaded into the breach of the gun. Um, so this is the kind of level we're aiming at for the mark graph, you know, really high detail. And again, in VR, if you're standing next to this, your head would come up to about here if you're about six foot. So I'd be about there. So you'd be able to walk around this and then we'd have virtual platforms to, st to stand and look inside. The very last things I'm doing in the final minus three minutes, uh, we're working on a large scale, but we're also moving down to the, the artifacts that have been recovered from the wreck, either legally or illegally. And our other colleague, Alice Watterson, who is presenting elsewhere here, um, has been scanning artifacts from the museum. So handheld um, uh, Artex scanner, there's one of the artifacts. artifacts. We've just been going to the Orkney Museums, sitting in their reception, getting stuff off the shelves, scanning it, putting it back. And then they brought all this stuff out of the cupboards that they didn't have room, room to show. Uh, so we ended up with things like these little uh, ceramic light holders that have come out of one of the battleship boardrooms. And then somebody's personal stein, you know, a beautiful object. And then bits of uh, compasses. And then these are uh, big brass, massive brass uh, uh, binoculars that sit where the gun, they're, they're basically gun sights. They're for spotting targets and then controlling the guns. And the very last bit is uh, what we've been doing for the museums is the stuff they've not been able to show, we've been building them uh, for use in augmented reality. So uh, we're in the process, uh, we're just about to start to build a book for them. So while the stuff that's in the cupboards can't be seen, they'll just have a, a book that will lay flat on the desk. Uh, we're using Zapper as an AR device at the moment because it's freely available to the user. We don't like the branding on it, so our team programmer, John Anderson, is going to be looking at producing our own. Uh, but in the moment, we're planning to have objects like this. This is the dolphin of HMS Royal Oaks tender ship. So it's, um, it'd have a boat that would take the Admiral backwards and forwards, and it had two of these brass ornaments uh, on the side of the ship. And I think, acknowledge, oh, right. So other artifacts are these. I'll rush through these because I have no time. But these are stuff that was stolen off the mark graph, which have now been recovered. And um, they're all going to be scanned and put into the same book. So you'll be able to see these objects as they've been recovered in 3D. I'll rush through. They're cool. And acknowledgements. I won't read it out. That's us, the extended team. Thank you for the extra five minutes or so.